Well, good morning, everybody. Good to hear all the chatter. Brothers and sisters in Christ enjoying their fellowship, right? So, it's a beautiful day today. Sun is shining. It's, uh, each day is a gift, right? Let's be glad in it. So, let's start with the announcements here. Um, Tuesday, they're handing out food for Passionate Ministry. Uh, ladies Bible Study at the Oakley Church here. And, of course, we have a board meeting. It seems like those are coming quicker and quicker all the time. Um, Wednesday's Bible study here at the church. And May 6th coming up is a National Day of Prayer event. Uh, we'll be, there will be a breakfast at the Riverfront Grill, and we'll be meeting at the poll for prayer. And uh, let's see, Crystal wants to speak. She's got oh, something. No. <laughs> done we, we do have a couple of visitors here Joe and Mike so, so they're coming to hear uh, Blair speak so let's uh, give them a welcome there's a welcome here there's a welcome here there's a Christian welcome here hallelujah there's a welcome here there's a welcome here there's a Christian welcome here Okay, is there any birthdays last week? No birthdays? I see we have an anniversary to celebrate. Charles and Paula. So happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary. All right, let's stand and let's say our pledges. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. And to the Bible, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Okay. And it's time for our invocation. This morning it's uh, the words of Paul where he is speaking about putting on Christ. And it says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent, 
the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Let's pray. Blessed are you, God Almighty, creator of the universe, we gave you, who gave to us the light of the world, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who gave us your commandments, statutes, principles for our good and your glory. Today, Father, as we come to worship you, help us to awake out of our slumber and step into the light to see the nearness of our salvation. As we worship in the light this morning, reveal to us the truth of your word, that the world isn't falling to pieces, but the pieces are falling miraculously into place in accordance with your holy word. Father, lead us out of the darkness and into your holy and perfect light. These things we ask according to your will, and in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Kathleen, lead us in song. Oh, you all look good this morning. I just want to have a word of prayer for that engine that just went yeah. by. Yeah. Amen. Lord Jesus, I just ask that you would protect and guide and uh, protect those uh, firefighters, protect who, uh, what's involved, Lord, we don't know, but you do. And so we just ask your protection and your guidance and your will, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 What a friend we have in Jesus. <coughs> song is that. <clears throat> Let's go over to, oh, how I love Jesus. <clears throat> you forgot to get your, you had to get your page? Okay. Okay.
singing. You may be seated. Okay, it's time for our, our worship and tithes and offerings. So, let's see. We didn't have anybody sign up, so I'm seeking a volunteer. Charlene, you want to pray for the offering, please? It's time for our praises and concerns, and you see on the back of the bulletin the praises that we have listed here, um, prayer requests, uh, of course, we praise that uh, Pastor and Lucy are able to take time and go visit Pastor's mom and, and uh, brother-in-law, I uh, pray for traveling mercies there, um, spoke to Carl and Marilyn uh, on Friday, uh, Marilyn has been cancer-free, but she's still having problems with uh, her oxygen level because of her lung issues, so continue to pray there. Uh, of course, Chuck and Sylvia, they continue to battle various uh, ailments. Uh, Walter, uh, Sissy, uh, Russ's brother, Russ. I saw Russ here someplace. You have an update on your brother? Okay. All right. So continue to pray for Russ's brother. Um, and we see here the orphans' names that are listed here. And I did get the uh, letter from Pastor Peter and the list of names on the bulletin board there. So when you have time, take and read the letter and uh, read over the list of names. So is there any other... Prayer requests or concerns? Amanda. Oh, it's just Jamie it has to take a driver's test this week, so pray for her because she has a lot. Of, she's a high anxiety girl, and just that she gets in that car and has peace and does what she knows how to do. So, very well. Okay. Pray for clear roads so there's no. Uh, okay. Crystal? Plus, she has respiratory issues and heart issues to begin with, so she really needs our prayers. So, any, yeah, Jim? The family of Sean McDonough, he died of COVID about a week, a little over a week ago. Okay. And his wife, they died. All right. Okay, so. McDonough. Yeah, so pray for the McDonough family. So, lot, lots of prayer needs going on, but we have a Lord that answers prayer, right? Yes, we do. So, okay, there is uh, nothing else. We will have uh, 
Kathleen come and lead us in the chorus, and Blair's going to come and um, pray. Nancy? Oh, unspoken prayer requests. I know there's always lots of those. So. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Let's stand. Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house here on this beautiful spring day. We've just heard a, a lot about needs of our congregation, needs of people outside our congregation. Lord, there's a lot of COVID and coronavirus, whatever that is, amongst our congregation, amongst our people. We ask for a, a healing upon everyone who's been touched by this, including Janet, who's in the hospital with it now. We ask for blessings upon the Qualls family and, and people who have been continue to be impacted by this, this virus. Lord, you know our needs that have been expressed go far and wide beyond the four walls of this church. We ask for divinity. We ask for answers to these prayers. We ask for your continuing and everlasting presence in our lives. May you touch each and every one of us and all of us who cannot be here today. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Okay, it's our weekly Proverbs. Today it is Proverbs 17, verses 16 through 19. Why should fools have money in hand to buy wisdom when they are not able to understand it? A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. One who has no sense shakes hands in pledge and puts up security for a neighbor. Whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. May the Lord be pleased at the reading of his word. So, okay. Uh, before we have uh, the special music, I came across a, a quote. You know, we all have gifts, right? Talents that we have that we didn't go seeking them, but they were just given to us by God. And this quote by John L. Wooden says, "Gifts, uh, Talent is a gift from God. Be humble. Praise of man, praises or, or fame is uh, from man. Be grateful. So I thought that was kind of a neat uh, quote, and I messed it up. But I will have it memorized because I bought a plaque, and I'm going to put it up in my office. So if you've got talents, thank God for it, you know, and use it. So, okay, it's time for our special music. And then uh, Berlier will bring his message, and we'll proceed from there. I'm what's left of a trio, so you're going to put up with me this morning. One of us is in Alaska, and the other one is sick, so I guess you're stuck with me. <laughs> 
I would like to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else can take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me. Till someday I see his blessed face above. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else can take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. No one else can take the sin and darkness from me. Well done, as always, Jim. Don Bear and friends are proud. First of all, thank you for the uh, opportunity and pleasure and, and uh, privilege, really, to, to be here provide this uh, sermon here today. Uh, thanks to my friends, Joe and Mike, for being here. I mentioned to them last weekend that I'd be preaching here today, and we didn't really have any conversation about it since then. But uh, I was in the shower today, and I said, you know, there's probably a 55-45 chance these guys show up. <laughs> and sure enough, they're here. So thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. And thank you to my wonderful... <clears throat> yes, yes. Thank you to my wonderful family in the back row being here to support me today, as always, especially after a busy Saturday. I wish uh, Cousin Jamie were here today uh, to see her bestie in the front pew, and I uh, wish Granny were here and other people were here. So a uh, pastor has said in the past that um, oftentimes the, the person who's, who's really delivering the sermon gets the most out of it, and um, as I started preparing the sermon probably two or three weeks ago. It's, it's certainly the case. Um, I'd say my biggest dilemma over the past 24 hours has been what to wear. <laughs> and and that's, that's really for uh, two reasons. Um, first and foremost, I haven't been able to travel overseas for uh, about 16 months. So I, I, have, uh, I have a wardrobe in, in, in Thailand. I have a wardrobe in Hong Kong. I've got uh, one in Spain, I've got one elsewhere in Europe. Uh, so I had to put together some clothes kind of last minute there. And, and then, of course, when you go to college or university for the first time and you uh, maybe spend a little bit too much time studying, um, there's something known as the freshman 15, which is where you put on weight. <laughs> And uh, given coronavirus and um, inability to, to live life uh, normally, I'd say it's a COVID-30 in my case. <laughs> so I put together this sermon, 
Uh, it's great that we can get uh, Pastor John some time to spend time away from the church, away from Owasso, see his mother. He uh, emailed last night, so this is the, I think the first time in a year and a half he's able to see his mother. And the first time in two years he's, he's been out there with Lucy at a meal. So we're, we're great to uh, give him a little bit of uh, a rest. The title of my sermon here today is Exploring Biblical Irony and the Irony of a Personal Challenge. So first and foremost, if, um, if you've attended a fish, fish fry here at the, the church, you probably have seen me wearing this very strange pink apron, which is uh, pictured here. Um, the wonderful ladies of the church have off, offered many a time to, to, to wash and uh, iron the apron. So I just find it ironic that I'm up here uh, having not ironed the apron, talking about irony. The other reason why I'm really excited to be here today is because my great-grandparents uh, met each other as a result of this church being here. It's back in, I think, the uh, 1910s. So if it were not for this church, uh, you'd be looking at a blank wall. So this church has been here now for 140 years, and I dare say what you're about to see might be the most unique introduction that we've, we've had at this church in 140 years. Do we have any drummers here? Anybody play drums in school or anything? No? I need, I need a little bit of air drums here just to get ready. Just lightly in front of the pew in front of you like that. There we go. All right. Get ready. Get ready. This is what I call encouragement from an old friend. Hi, this is Barry Williams from The Brady Bunch. I have a big hello here for the Oakley Community Church. And I got excited when my friend Blair told me he would be preaching at the church located in, where else, Brady Township. Because, well, I'm Greg Brady. Also a special hello to my biggest fan, Blair's cousin, Amanda. Well, Blair, I want you to carpe diem. Keep on keeping on. It's all for one and one for all. And may your preaching go as well as a beautiful sunshine day. All right. So, I'm not sure everybody realizes that's, that's the actual real Greg Brady. So about a month ago, I contacted him on a Sunday afternoon and said, uh, could you re record this introductory video? And he was nice enough. So literally within an hour, I had it in my inbox. So uh, thank you to, uh, to Barry Williams and Greg Brady. About uh, April 2012, I gave a sermon in the church called, Did Jesus Play Baseball? Um, I know a few of you were actually here then. I think Fred and Trudy were just starting to come to this church. I know Bobby were at the church, because I remember talking to you about the book of Hosea. And I was impressed by, uh, impressed by that. So in this sermon that I gave, I made an analogy. I said, um, with what happened at the trial of Jesus, and the crucifixion, etc. It's very similar to what we actually see in baseball. Sometimes in baseball, when there's a trade, there is a player to be named later. And in the case of this player here, Jeremy Bonderman, uh, he was involved in a three-way trade back in 2002 between the Tigers, between the Yankees, and between the A's. So the analogy that I gave is that uh, all of us, if we believe in Christ, we are actually the player to be named later based on what happened there at the, the trial. So uh, Christ basically took the place of Barabbas um, at that trial. So I made that analogy. And then a couple months later, I gave another uh, sermon here. I called it, I titled it, The World is Too Much With Us. And I gave this sermon because when I think about the the incredible odds that we all have in terms of being God's most favorite creature. I put together this slide. 
a couple weeks ago. So there are 7.8 billion people in the world. There are about 10 quintillion insects, 400 billion birds. These are all estimates, of course. Over 3 trillion trees, over 3 trillion fish. And how many planets are there? I, I was really surprised. So when we were in school, we learned how many planets are out there? Nine, right? And if you think about Pluto, there were actually eight and a half, because Pluto sometimes decides to be a planet and not be a planet. <laughs> now they tell us that there are somewhere between 200 billion and one septillion planets in the entire universe. Septillion is the number one, the numeral one, followed by 24 zeros. So if you think about all of the living creatures in the world, it is an infinitesimal uh, possibility that we would actually be human beings. So we are truly blessed, and that was the uh, purpose of that sermon nine years ago. So I guess every nine years I'm uh, giving a sermon here, so I guess we can call this a continuing series. <laughs> the truth is I've been wanting to present a sermon here for several years. It's been working in my mind. This is actually not that sermon. This is not the sermon I've been working on. So maybe if I do a good job today, you'll, you'll have me back sometime. Speaking of Pluto, it's a little interesting tidbit. Does anyone know who this is? I know this guy here knows who this is because he has him on his fantasy baseball team. This is Clayton Kershaw. He's a, uh, he's a pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers. He, uh, during the 2010s, he was probably the most dominant pitcher in baseball. He actually played uh, minor league ball, single A ball, up in uh, Great Lakes Loons. I know Judith and family have been there before, and hopefully have seen him. I had a chance to meet Clayton uh, back in uh, back in his rookie year in 2007. I was the highest uh, bidder on his jersey during a breast breast cancer charity night, a pink jersey, which I still have. He signed it. Clayton is one of the most outspoken Christians uh, in Major League sports, certainly in, in Major League Baseball. Interestingly enough, his great uncle is the one who discovered Pluto in 1930. So I thought I'd give Clayton a uh, little recognition there. My sermon today is about irony. So first and foremost, I think we want to talk about what is irony. So the uh, dictionary would say irony in its broadest sense is a rhetorical device, literary technique, or event in which what on the surface appears to be the case or to be expected differs radically from what is actually the case in reality. So I put together this slide to uh, bring us up to speed, educate us a little bit on different types of irony. So we have dramatic irony, we have comic irony, we have situational irony, then we have verbal irony. So uh, an example of irony would be a firehouse burning down. So that would be tragic and situational irony. Um, ironically, as I was actually looking for this uh, a slide to put together, this firehouse is about two miles away from, from where I lived in New York. Um, I used to pass this firehouse all the time. I had no idea that it burned down a couple of years ago. Uh, sad irony there. How about a police station getting robbed? Is that ironic? That's situational irony for sure. This is a pitcher who uh, pitched back in the 1980s, probably late 70s as well. His name was Bob Walk. He played for the Pittsburgh Pirates, Philadelphia Phillies, probably some other teams. The last thing a pitcher wants to do is walk a batter. So there's some verbal irony there that this uh, pitcher is named Bob Walk. <laughs> Comic irony, a Facebook complaint about communication. This person says, I really hate it when people find it necessary to note their every single thought on Facebook. And the person said, thanks for sharing that thought. <laughs> so there's some comic irony there. This is a story about uh, an Israeli uh, pilot who was, uh, who is a military pilot who's afraid of flying. So of course there's situa situational irony there. And coming back to Greg Brady, I managed to uh, find this irony. So there was an episode where uh, he's caught smoking by his, uh, his siblings. He, of course, uh, denies it. And later on in life, 
we learned in his biography, autobiography, that uh, he would uh, smoke marijuana sometimes and be on set. In fact, there's an episode where he actually uh, was cut from a scene because he was uh, AUI, acting under the influence. So that would be situational irony involving Barry Williams. <clears throat> I put together uh, a sermon here today. I'm, I think I have it uh, committed to memory. So I'm gonna, not going to use my notes. But in this sermon here today, I want to talk about irony, talk about some biblical irony, because I think it helps reinforce different uh, lessons and different things we learn in the Bible. So God was very busy with water on day two and day three of the creation. We see day two, God separated the waters above. Day three, we can see what he was doing with water. There was evening and morning, etc. But we fast forward a little bit, and we think about the crucifixion. John 19, what does Jesus say? He says, I am thirsty. Isn't it ironic that the Son of God, the, the being who, who created the heavens and earth and all of creation, is asking for water? Imagine being that Roman soldier who took the hyssop and uh, helped Christ quench his thirst. So I have the... Um, the uh, scripture in each of these slides, uh, we're not going to read it, but if you want to jot it down for your own uh, study, that's good. Uh, John 19 is where this actually appears. The road to Emmaus, so um, before the ascension, the 40 days after the crucifixion, Jesus was uh, appeared to these two people on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus is actually uh, uh, here in the U.S. There, there's actually a city called Emmaus. So my best friend actually grew up in the city in Pennsylvania. It's uh, just south of Allentown. So if you're familiar with Billy Joel songs, you probably know uh, the song called Allentown. So Emmaus, of course, would have taken its name from that particular place in the Bible. So what actually happened on the road to Emmaus? These two people, these two men were walking. They would have recognized Christ, but they did not. This is actually recounted in some beautiful works of art. So one of my favorite artists is a painter called Caravaggio, who uh, was in the Renaissance. I think uh, Joe and I saw uh, Caravaggio in the Louvre, if I'm not mistaken, a few years ago. So here's a painting from 1601, painting from 1606. Caravaggio was a very expressive painter. So what is happening on this road to Emmaus? The two people say to Christ, haven't you heard what happened in Jerusalem? Of course, they were talking about the crucifixion. And what does Christ say? Christ says, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. So here they are trying to explain to the 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 one who was actually slain and crucified on the cross, what actually happened there. There is situational irony there. Jesus mocked as a king before Pilate. This part of the gospel is awash with all kinds of irony. Dramatic irony, situational irony. So in this exchange, God said, or Jesus says to Pilate, your authority here on earth is actually provided by God. God is with Jesus at this point in time, towards the end of his life. Did Pilate want to crucify Christ? Pilate vacillated. Pilate was indecisive. So really what happens in this scene, if you think about it, is Christ kind of turns the table on Pilate. So even though Christ is the one who is being judged, Pilate actually is the one who's being judged when you stop and think about it. It's also ironic that the soldiers uh, put this majestic crimson robe on Christ. Here it's depicted to be purple in some translations. It's ironic that uh, they mock him as the king of kings. Yet, in the end, it's every knee shall bow down to Christ. So there's irony there as well. 
Uh, we see that, of course, in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, John 18. This is another great one. What happens with Lazarus? Well, right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, the Pharisees plot to Jesus' death. There is some irony there, of course. John 11, 43 through 48. What do they say? What are we accomplishing, they ask. Here is the man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. This is also an ironic scene from the Bible. Jewish leaders avoid the praetorium, the temple of Pilate, but conspire to murder an innocent man. So the Jewish leaders did not want to enter the house of a Gentile because they were fearful they would not be able to participate, partake in the Passover meal. So here they are avoiding that uh, because they want to participate in that meal. Yet they are willing to participate in the slaughter of an innocent man, our risen Christ. So there is great irony there. And I was saying to myself, what if they were eating a lamb during that Passover meal? That would even add to the irony even more. That's from John 18. The book of John has a lot of, it's, it's a rich tapestry, a rich fabric of uh, lightness and darkness, of sight and blindness. Uh, this is a very interesting one. So Jesus refers to, to blindness and sin. For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who will see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. John 9. So a lot of irony there as well. This one's interesting. So when Christ was in the garden, Judas, Judas and the, the court officials, the soldiers, etc., approached him. And they had lanterns and torches, according to the Bible. So some commentary suggests that perhaps the, the, the night was moonlit. So Jesus, if you read scripture, was stumbling about. So here the light of the world is being approached by these officials with lanterns and torches. So the, um, the situational irony there was, was not lost upon me. That's from John 18. So uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. And what does he do one night? He goes to Christ, and Nicodemus was this teacher. Nicodemus, in fact, ends up being the one who was taught by Christ. And this is actually one of the most, perhaps, important encounters in the Bible, because this is uh, John 3. So when we talk about John 3.16, for God so loved the world... He gave his only begotten son. This is actually where this takes place. So this uh, irony of, of Jesus actually teaching him, and then at the end, inviting Nicodemus to follow him in his ministry. Very ironic. From the Old Testament, Genesis, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. They wanted to harm Joseph. But what actually ends up happening in the end? Joseph becomes the second most powerful man in Egypt, the vice regent, as it were. And from Genesis 37 through 50, we read about the, um, the procession related to the funeral of Joseph's father. So it is clear that he became a very powerful and accomplished person. This was foreshadowed in a dream that Joseph had. I think we can all implicitly understand that we would have situational irony when a shepherd boy named David confronts the Philistine warrior named Goliath in a fight to the end challenge and ends up beating him. That, of course, is from 1 Samuel 17, 50 through 51. This one, I 
perhaps liked the most. This is from a metaphor, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talks about uh, lanterns and uh, why they're important. They provide light. And Jesus makes the comment that uh, a lamp that is lit should not be hidden. It should be used to provide light. Yet, what is actually happening in Jesus' life when he makes these comments? Jesus is actually hidden. So when we think about uh, Isaiah 53, we talk about the uh, prophecy of the suffering servant, servitude that would coincide with Christ's coming. So whereas Jesus is uh, telling people that an actual physical uh, light, a lamp, should be used, the light of the world remains hidden. And we refer to this as the messianic secret. That's what modern day biblical scholars call it. So whereas um, Christ uh, talks about a, a simple instrument uh, to provide light, He's choosing to remain hidden. Now, why was he maybe choosing to be hidden? One of the reasons probably is because he didn't want to play his cards. He knew that he would incur the wrath and was incurring the wrath of the Romans. So he decided to, um, and he knew what was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. He decided to, uh, let's say, remain out of sight and uh, to not incur that wrath of the Romans. Um, when we think about what type of individual probably would have been required to overturn uh, Roman rule, that person probably had to be some sort of political revolutionary. But in reality, um, Christ, coupled with that revolutionary aspect to his ministry, Christ indeed was that suffering servant that we, we hear about in Isaiah 53. So that would be Matthew 5 and Matthew 13. And then this one uh, also is uh, very interesting. So uh, Christ renamed Simon Peter. So the word Peter, pater, is the Greek word for rock. So Christ instructs how he will build his church upon the rock. But what happens when Peter denies Christ three times? The rock actually crumbles. So there's a lot of situational and verbal irony there. If you've been to Rome, maybe you've had a chance to be inside St. Peter's Basilica. So Peter was actually uh, uh, crucified upside down in what is now called St. Peter's Square in, at the St. Peter's Basilica. So uh, the emperor, I think it was Constantine back in the fourth century or so, decided to build a Christian church on top of the area where uh, St. Peter was crucified. And then back in, I think, the um, 16th century, uh, the Pope Julius II, I think, is the one who decided to rebuild the church. Now, the beautiful columns you see here are by an artist called Bernini. And then, of course, uh, Michelangelo is one of the uh, three people who was involved in... Uh, actually designing the dome. St. Peter's remains are actually underneath the altar there. That's what is uh, believed to, to be the case. I've been here. I was here. Uh, uh, such a beautiful building, such a beautiful creation. Uh, Michelangelo's Pieta sculpture is, is, is right there as well. If you've watched uh, Christmas at the Vatican or something like that, which, which I'm very fond of doing, um, you will, will see in this scene. So uh, Christ Church truly is built upon Saint, uh, top St. Peter. So some, a lot of irony there as well. That's from Matthew 16, Matthew 26. Jesus heals a leper. What kind of life would a leper have lived back then during the time of Jesus? Well, as we know, they probably would have been pariahs. They would have been social outcasts. They would have been ostracized from society. So Jesus ends up healing this leper who is then able to integrate with society. But what happens to Jesus as a result? Jesus himself becomes ostracized, cast out due to the publicity of what he has just done. He, he's out there. He essentially changes places with the leper when you think about it. 
Mark 1, Matthew 8, Luke 13. This one is um, another great one, I think. So the Apostle Paul is uh, probably responsible for um, more of the early Christian communities in Asia Minor and Europe than uh, anyone else. So he was a, a seminal, important person. But before he had that conversion on the road to Damascus, what type of person was he? Well, he was probably a terrible person. His name was Saul. He was um, uh, murdering Christians. He was uh, tormenting them. He was persecuting them. He was imprisoning them. So isn't it ironic that uh, 20 to 30 years after Christ's uh, earthly ministry ended, that we have this person, Paul, become converted. And in reality, he is probably uh, the certainly one of the most important people um, in terms of disseminating the word about Christ. I think uh, 14 of the 27 uh, New Testament books are attributable to Paul. And I'd say uh, about half of the book of Acts is also attributable to Paul. So this is from Romans 1, but of course uh, we, we find Paul omnipresent throughout the New Testament. And finally, when we think about what was happening on the cross that day, what was happening with the crucifixion, Satan was trying to destroy Jesus. So Jesus, of course, was there to absorb our future sin. And while the world first initially thought that it was Christ who was defeated, in the end, it is Satan who is hanging on those gallows. It is Satan who is uh, defeated. Great, great irony there. 1 Timothy 1 is where I pulled that from. I was born on an island. This is the island where I was born. Has anybody else here born on an island? I think you were born on a peninsula, maybe? Okay, so that's surrounded by three sides of one. I got to be. <laughs> on this island, Long Island, where I was born, uh, I lived family home right around that purple star. A lot of famous people from my town, uh, the Baldwin brothers, like Alec Baldwin, Jerry Seinfeld, um, Steve Gutenberg, Joey Buttafuoco. Shouldn't really, shouldn't really call him famous. All around me, we had a bunch of uh, towns named after biblical uh, cities. So there's Babylon. Every day, I took the Babylon train to Wall Street. Got up at 3:15. Caught the 4:52 train a.m. Uh, Wontaw, right next to me, used to be called Jerusalem itself. Beth Page, uh, where my father learned to golf, right up the road, two miles away. It's where Tiger Woods won his first U.S. Open on the Beth Page Black Golf Course, right up the road. Jericho is another one. So uh, all around me, there were these uh, biblical names. This is my father, uh, basic training. Back in December 1964, uh, he was in San Antonio. And uh, his uncle Paul said, uh, Peter, you uh, really want to enlist, because if you don't, you're going to get drafted in the uh, Vietnam War. His uncle Paul had been in the uh, Korean War. So my dad probably did the right thing and enlisted. This is him at our old house in New York back in May 1965. My dad did so well in basic training that the uh, military <coughs> said, what do you want to do? And he ended up in Japan. My father worked for uh, what we probably would call military intelligence now. He was a reconnaissance cartographer, which is a fancy way of saying he was uh, a map maker. So during the Vietnam War, the spy planes would go over Southeast Asia, Vietnam, they take photographs, they drop the canisters, somebody would collect them, and then he and his team at Yokota Air Force Base in Tokyo would interpret those uh, photographs and uh, help decide what they were actually looking at and what the troops on the ground in Vietnam were seeing. He was a member of the 67th Reconnaissance Technical Squadron. Um, they wrote a book about this squadron. I actually bought this book for him uh, not too long ago. He's actually uh, featured in that book. So my father loved Japan. The US military told him that uh, he had to transfer out of Japan at some point in time. 
And they gave him, I think, three different choices. One of those choices was Hawaii. So uh, he invited his high school girlfriend, my mother, to uh, marry him. So she flew over to Hawaii. Uh, and uh, he was a young guy. He was 19, 20, 21 years old. He hated leaving Japan. He was having the time of his life. But they got married in February 1967. This is my mother about 15 months later. Beautiful woman, May 1968. I think this photograph is from in Hawaii. I was born in uh, 1973 in New York, as I said. Uh, then lived in Florida briefly, and then ended up in South Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. This is the uh, house I've lived in for eight or nine years. That's me on the front lawn back in, I think, early 1976. Uh, just by sheer coincidence, my father was actually driving past this old house on April 1st, so just a couple weeks ago. This is what it looks like now. So we didn't have a boat, we didn't have a, a basketball hoop back then. You can kind of see the, yeah. kind of is the same house there. That's us in the backyard of that house in South Jersey. That's me with hair. <laughs> in the bottom left. That's also me with hair. Wearing a Harvard uh, a sweatshirt. Showing some young intellectual prowess. So the fact is, I, uh, one of the blessings uh, that I have in my life is, is my intellect. Um, I can remember being probably five or six years old and teaching myself exponents. I actually taught myself uh, uh, two to the 14th power. Now, I had no idea what an exponent was at that point in time, but I could calculate these huge numbers um, at this very, very... Uh, young age. I remember sitting in the bathtub with my brother, uh, who was probably two or three years old, trying to convince him or, or teach him these things, and yeah, obviously uh, didn't go too far. But when I was in uh, elementary school, I had some Japanese friends. Their fathers were uh, working for Subaru in North America. They got transferred to South Jersey, and uh, they were really smart. They were super fast in mathematics. And uh, the teacher would, would have these, in different grades, would have these, these mathematics contests. And I could keep up with them. Sometimes I could actually beat them. I had the privilege of uh, uh, flying over to Tokyo en route to Bangkok back in 2012 to catch up with them for the first time in, in uh, nearly 29 years. So here I am with a uh, guy on the left is actually a twin with another guy who's not there. And then another friend there on the right, Kichi and Tetsuro are their names. So we went out for sushi in the Ginza, went out for some whale. Um, I took him out for whale because I wanted to eat whale. So there we are in Tokyo, and uh, these were some of the mathematical uh, prodigies that I was able to beat. So for a long time in my life, I've had this, um, maybe tension is the right word, not a conflict, but a tension between the left side and right side of my brain. The left side, of course, in your brain is one where logic and things like that take place. Um, that's where the mathematical and some of the other things uh, would, would have come into place. Right side of your brain is, is really creativity, expression. So I think I got most of my left side of my brain from my father, most of my right side of my brain from my mother. She certainly is one who uh, taught me how to write along with some teachers in school, and uh, uh, I, I still do quite a lot of writing, so I'm, I'm gracious. Part of that left side of the brain really is interested in positioning and location. Here I am at an interesting location about three years ago. If you recognize this scene, this is the uh, DMZ, Demilitarized Zone, uh, just north of Seoul. This is what connects the uh, countries of South Korea and North Korea. So uh, if you remember, just uh, probably 18 months or two years ago, Donald Trump, uh, President Trump, walked across the line between those buildings and shook hands with uh, Kim Jong-un from North Korea. That building there on the right, the blue one, uh, I was actually inside that building, and I was actually uh, able to step foot across into North Korea. So um, the, there's a, that's a South Korean soldier, actually, who guards the door 
to make sure no uh, idiots like me would try to open the door and actually sneak into North Korea. You can see there's a few locks on the door. So I managed to, uh, to, to get that photograph taken. I was on a tour and some Norwegian people uh, took that photograph for me. So I'm actually in North Korea there. Uh, that's just a few feet past where Donald Trump would have walked into North Korea. Um, interestingly enough, this is just so weird. When I was in uh, the demilitarized zone, the joint security area, uh, three years ago, it was the exact moment that uh, President Trump in the White House was announcing this reapproachment with uh, North Korea. It just happened to be the same hour, the same day, uh, just by complete chance. So given my interest in positioning and probably something I inherited from my father with his map making and, and cartographical interest, I decided to download an app. Of course, the 38th parallel latitude is what separates North Korea from South Korea. And even though I didn't take this at the exact moment when I was in North Korea, we can see I was pretty close there, 37 spot 94. Uh, so I was right there at uh, right just above 38th parallel when I was in North Korea. So the town that I grew up in for those eight years in South Jersey was, um, uh, in New Jersey terms, it was a kind of an important town. Um, it was a racially integrated town. There was a famous uh, Supreme Court case in the state of New Jersey that basically said minority uh, households had to have the same right in terms of house ownership that, uh, let's say, regular households would have or, or white households might have. Went all the way to the Supreme Court. This is a house that was uh, kind of across the street from me, two or three houses down. Um, the person who lived here was the fastest man in the world. His daughter was in my class for, I think, uh, six years. So this is his obituary from the New York Times. Uh, clearly, he was a, a black gentleman, and um, when he died a few years ago, this is what they said. They said he was the fastest man in the world. I think it was the 1956 uh, Olympics in Rome where his team uh, won the gold medal before it was taken away due to an illegal baton change or something. And then I think he played for the Philadelphia Eagles and Washington Redskins, or the team formerly known as the Washington Redskins, uh, football teams. This is a book I actually bought it not too long ago about the racial integration in uh, my community. My next door neighbors were uh, black. This is, this is all going somewhere, so just stay with me, please. This is a picture from nursery school. I think this was probably May 1977 or 78 or something like that. My, uh, this was actually, I think it was May Day, so maybe it was around May 1. We, I remember walking around some maypole holding some string or something. My black teacher there, her name was Mrs. Moore. Interestingly enough, uh, Mrs. Moore's son-in-law was a gentleman called Ronald McNair. He was the mission control specialist who was blown up on the space shuttle Challenger back in 1986. I think he actually uh, came to our nursery school and uh, I probably would have had a chance to meet him. That's me there, second from the left, the cute one. And this, uh, this nursery school is actually still at uh, this church in South Jersey, in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. My mother still attends this church. It's a United Methodist Church. It's where I was baptized for the second time. My mother still serves on the nursery school committee there uh, 40 years later. So here we are with my mother. Uh, she got her hands on us and started taking us to uh, the church that she would have raised in. Not the same physical church, but the United Methodist Church. So there I am with my brother and my mother, back there probably around 1980 or late 70s or 81. I remember getting the Good News Bible as a young boy. I'd often find myself reading the Bible to and fro church. I always find myself drawn to the, the, the gospel uh, about the uh, crucifixion. I just found something very, very interesting about that. Around this time of my life, I can remember being about five or six years old, being in bed at night, and having battles between my left hand and my right hand. And for some reason, my left hand would win, even though I am right-handed, and I throw a ball with my right hand, and I write with my right hand. 
For some reason, the left hand would always win these battles. I also remember sitting there uh, imagining myself getting married one day. And I imagined myself having to um, having a discussion with my, my wife, telling her what my middle name is. And of course, nowadays, uh, I realize that if your wife doesn't know your middle name, you probably should be, not be getting married. <laughs> this house was uh, two houses down from me, and one night I got burglarized. This created a lot of stress uh, in my life. And in this Bible, in Sunday school, at that church we just looked at, I learned that Jesus sits on the right-hand side of God. So all of a sudden, my right hand became much more important to me than my left hand. So my, my right hand would win those battles when they fought at night as a result of that burglary. Back in 1984, my family moved to New Hampshire. My parents decided to, uh, my father was a business executive, my parents decided to build a beautiful custom-built house. So that's it being constructed in, in 1984. And this is from uh, Google Earth, Google Maps about 10 years ago. This is what it looks like now. Not too much has really changed, it looks like. Every day coming down from the, the, the uh, bus after I'd get dropped off from school, I would have to kick a rock with my right foot. I'd have to kick it in a certain location. And if I didn't kick it in a certain location, I wouldn't allow myself to go inside the house. So clearly some ritualistic, some obsessive compulsive behavior was manifesting itself. Um, there were a lot of stressors in my life back then, probably some normal teens uh, types of stress. I don't want to get into it here, far too, inter, you know, far too personal. But suffice to say, there were different things happening um, in my life. And um, a lot of the ways that I would, uh, rituals that I would uh, undertake involved my right hand. This looks like some sort of uh, weird shape or building or something. This is, actually, uh, this is actually how I pray. So I have this certain shape in my mind and at different points along uh, that strange shape, I pray for different people, I pray for different things, I, I uh, ask for forgiveness for sin and, and all these things. This is how my, my mind, that left side of my brain, is able to organize and remember all the key things and people and, and uh, different aspects that, that I want to pray for. Um, for probably at least a couple of decades, I've really eaten with chopsticks instead of forks. Uh, I've lived, you know, lived in Asia for quite some time. And long before that, I really started f uh, eating with chopsticks. Now, if you look at the chopsticks in these series of photographs, you'll notice that they're pointing in a certain direction. They're pointing up and to the right. It is this, uh, again, this ritual that I do as a reflection of what I learned in Sunday school, to be close to God, to be close to Christ. So here I am at home here, eating a salad. You can see my chopsticks. Here I am eating some uh, meal. I guess I was in somewhere in Asia, probably Thailand. Here I am, chopsticks are in the same location. This is uh, probably in, in Thailand as well. Chopsticks in the same location. This, uh, I took this at a business meeting. This woman is uh, some sort of relation to the, the king of Thailand. And I took the photograph, not because of my chopsticks, but because she reminded me of a Star Wars character uh, whose name was uh, Maz Kanata. Has anybody seen this person? <laughs> so this is, from the, uh, this is from the more recent Star Wars movie. She plays an important role. She, she gives Luke Skywalker's lightsaber to Luke Skywalker's uh, daughter. I think her name is Ray. So, you see it? A little bit. Anyway, the point is you can see my uh, chopsticks there in the same location. Here I am. Uh, I'm really fond of long straws. As my uh, family back there will attest to, I think I uh, probably hold the record. I stood on a chair at Culver's in Saginaw, and I had 19 straws from a, a cup. And I was able to actually 
draw the uh, draw the drink up, 19 straws. The sushi buffet here isn't important. What's important is you can see my chopsticks. They're they're in a certain location. A uh, couple times over the past six or seven years, I've lived in Spain in the Spanish Mediterranean. This was a view from my balcony of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. So a beautiful part of the world, uh, facing east, southeast. You probably can't see Africa in that photograph, but from a certain angle you can see it. So very, again, very interested in my positioning. Every day I would go to the same Chinese restaurant there in Spain and order the same fish and the same chopsticks would be in the same location on my plate. And here we are, I think at an airport in uh, probably Bangkok or Tokyo or somewhere. Eating, yeah, uh, probably about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, eating, eating some Japanese food for breakfast. Chopsticks in the same location, same location, same location. Here I am in China. This was uh, with my translator. They hired to uh, translate for me since I don't speak Mandarin fluently. Uh, <clears throat> we stopped for a meal, a lunch in Guangzhou, China. Uh, here I am eating chicken blood. That's what they served. So they took a chicken, and we had some chicken, and then we had to, to have the chicken blood. Uh, so there I am with my chopsticks in the same location in China, and again somewhere in Asia. Here I am eating ice cream with uh, chopsticks back in 2012. I'm a national hero in Thailand for doing that. I think they're going to put me on their, their money. But when I was done with that ice cream, uh, my chopsticks were in the same location. So there I am uh, shortly after moving to Bangkok in 2012. When I do have to resort to a fork, the same thing happens. The fork is uh, pointed and to the right. Again, that closeness, that proximity in my mind to Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> lived in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, back in 2016. Here I am, my breakfast plate, chopsticks in the same location. The same thing happens when I travel. So. Um, as an international business person, I probably flew about 110 times in uh, 2017. Probably that's like every three days or so. That's a lot. Um, all over the world. So what happens is when I'm taking off in an airplane or when I'm touching down in an airplane, my right hand needs to be higher than my left hand. So here I am on Qantas Airlines uh, over Australia. Here I am just taking off uh, Norwegian Airlines, Gatwick, London, coming up uh, to Turkey, uh, so just uh, flying into uh, southern Turkey there on route to Istanbul. Here I am flying over uh, Cairo, you can see the uh, metropolis of Cairo there. Here I am flying over Greenland, Greenland is atop my bucket list, places I want to visit, flown over it so many times, so beautiful there. Austria, so I flew from Zurich to uh, into Vienna uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Again, taking off, uh, landing, all the same thing. That's because flying is very stressful for me. So um, I've gotten much better. I can now sleep on airplanes uh, sometimes, but uh, that was not always the case. So again, that closeness to God, to Jesus, is what I sought, right hand above the left hand. Here I am flying from uh, Hokkaido. Uh, North Island of Japan, where I was for a few days, to, uh, I think I was going to Sapporo, I'm oh, sorry, I was in Sapporo flying to uh, Osaka. So I'm going from Hokkaido to the island of Honshu, uh, same thing, and then uh, Los Angeles. So, same thing happens when I cross state lines. This is a couple weeks ago, coming back to Michigan. Uh, after uh, Easter, I was crossing into Pennsylvania. So when I cross the state line, the right hand is always, always, even unconsciously I do it, above my left hand. Uh, I think you all probably recognize this sign. Well, the one in the, uh, the foreground, not the background, not the cannabis sign. <laughs> well, maybe some of you do, but that's not my business. So coming into Michigan, uh, right hand above the left hand. Same thing with bridges. This is the George Washington Bridge back in early December. Crossing from New Jersey into Manhattan, going from New Jersey into Delaware. This is an interesting one. This is actually uh, crossing a continent on a bridge. This is going from Europe into Asia. Uh, that bridge, I, I've been on it, I think, a couple times. Tiger Woods 
And I think Serena Williams maybe uh, filmed a commercial there on that bridge. So you can cross from Europe to Asia there in Istanbul on that bridge. That's the Bosporus Straits. Here we are at the Verrazano Bridge. I would travel between lots and lots and lots, hundreds of times in my life, connecting Brooklyn and Staten Island. Even though you're still in New York State, I still have my right hand above my left hand. And then I moved to uh, Bangkok in 2012 and attended this wonderful church called ECB, the Evangelical Church of Bangkok. Uh, this is uh, a typical Sunday morning, it's just a few more people than we have here. We have over 1,000 people uh, on a typical Sunday morning, uh, generally two different services. And now with COVID, they have three different services. Really blessed to uh, have a great church outside of my home church. It's one of the great things about traveling is you get to experience uh, uh, get to experience Jesus in different cultures, in different cities, in different countries, in different churches, in different ways of praying. So the uh, for about the past 10 years or so, Pastor David King and his wife, Ty King, uh, have been the uh, leaders of the church. Uh, whilst I was there most recently, we had five pastors of the church. She's actually originally from Michigan. She sent me a message today telling me to do well, and I talked with her the other day, so I greatly appreciate it. Uh, they would have me over to their house, which at that time was an apartment on the campus of the church for supper, and she'd always serve chopsticks. And I ex was explaining to them one night how my chopsticks or my fork always had to be in the same location, and what I would do when I would take off on an airplane or when I would land on an airplane, and Pastor David immediately said, that's because you don't trust Jesus. And it startled me. It was a, somewhat of a brutal statement, if you think about it, in terms of brute force. But then I gave, began thinking about it. And I said, yes, okay, I can buy that maybe, perhaps, I don't trust Jesus enough. All these ritualistic behaviors, even though we're well-intentioned to be closer to Christ and favor my right side over my left side because that's what I learned in Sunday school as a boy and I felt safe and it helped reduce stress in my life. He was explaining to me that uh, very, very succinctly that was the case. And um, I think he's right. I think he's right. And it evidences the growth that I continue to need to have in my own life as a Christian. Now, I can take off on an airplane and rationally realize I'm not going to crash or uh, have some sort of uh, accident if my right hand is not above my left hand. I've gotten to that point where I can manage my stress that well. But I think um, it was a very good lesson for me. So on this day that I'm preaching and talking about biblical irony, it's ironic that something that I would take solace and comfort from in the Bible in terms of trying to reduce my own personal stress which makes me feel closer and safer through that proximity with God and Jesus actually is a blocker. It's a blocker in my spiritual life. And um, it took a meal in Bangkok to actually realize that. So I'd like to thank you for listening to me uh, drone on there for quite some time. Uh, again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I encourage you, if you ever have the chance to get up and maybe uh, say a sermon one day, it, yeah, it can be a little daunting, maybe a little uh, nerve-wracking, but it's really the person delivering the sermon who, who gets the most out of it. Uh, so um, I'd like to thank all of you for allowing me to be here today. So thank you. haven't we? And I'm truly, I'm truly found out this morning, you don't want to hear this, do you? Sure, go ahead. Okay. That I'm a right brain person. I am not a left brain person, and I'm glad there's somebody in here that is. Well, I'm, I'm both. That's the problem. <laughs> You're both? Yes. Okay. Oh my goodness. You got my head just a spinning and spinning. Right. I, I might have to become a left hand brain, left just, hand? Just keep it like this. Okay, left brain person. 
You have truly been a blessing Thank this you. morning. Thanks. How ironic. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. You want to stand? We'll Let's, uh, yeah. sing a closing hymn here. And who knew? Who knew? I didn't know until this morning before I come to church what he was going to speak on. And, and then when I read it, I still didn't know, you know, the, the caption of it. But anywhere with Jesus. That's right. We can safely go. Yes. Whether we got a hand up here or a hand up here. That's right. Whether we're left brain or right brain or Jim, both. Yes. <laughs> Whatever. Anywhere with Jesus. Amen. We can safely go. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, I can safely go anywhere he needs me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearer choice will fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid.